Good afternoon. It's Sunday, the 15th of February. I'm Aaron Viner, and this is IBA News broadcasting from Jerusalem. We open with this morning's fatal shooting by Danish police of a gunman they believe killed a Jewish guard at a Copenhagen synagogue last night and murdered another person at a cultural event on the freedom of speech earlier in the evening. We get more in this report from IBA's Marko Dudkevich. We're having some difficulties with that, and we hope to bring it to you later in the program. In the meantime, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has expressed his condolences to the Danish people and to the Jewish community in Denmark while warning that the shooting attack at the Copenhagen synagogue won't mark the end of Islamist extremist terrorism against European Jews. Here with more is IBA's diplomatic correspondent, Eli Wogelenter. Prime Minister Netanyahu has once again called for European Jews to immigrate to Israel following the shootings in Copenhagen. Netanyahu opened the weekly cabinet meeting saying extreme Islamic terror in Europe has struck again and this time it's in Denmark. They are once again killing Jews on European soil simply for being Jewish. The wave of attacks against Jews in Europe is expected to continue and it is up to us to stay prepared. Jews need protection wherever they are. But we're telling you Israel is your home. Prime Minister said that Israel is prepared for a massive wave of immigration from Europe and announced that the government has approved a 180 million shekel program to assist with Aliyah, a plan put forth by the Ministry of Immigration and Absorption to encourage immigration from France, Belgium and Ukraine. It was not clear if the program will be expanded to assist Danish Jews as well. Foreign Minister Avigdor Liebman said the terror attacks in Copenhagen proved the need for a truly uncompromising war against Islamic terror and its causes. Diaspora Affairs Minister Naftali Bennett said Israel cannot accept that Jews are simply shot on the streets of Europe. We will not let Jews become easy targets for anti-Semitic attacks. We're seeing uh, growing anti-Semitism and violence against Jews across Europe. Um, we're seeing growing radicalization and Islamization of Europe. I'm profoundly worried about the Jews. The message is very clear. Israel is there for you. You might decide to stay, but if you decide to come to Israel, we're waiting for you. Israel is the state of the Jews and will always be here for you. Where's this anti-Semitism coming from? Or maybe it's not anti-Semitism, maybe it's anti-Israel, or do they both uh, go together? Well, the new anti-Semitism is sort of cloaked in anti-Israel, uh, um, but it's the same uh, thing. It, it just looks a bit different. We're seeing a combination of uh, good old classic anti-Semitism fu uh, fusing with uh, um, radical Islam, which is growing in, uh, in Europe. And, uh, you know, the, the future of Jews in Europe is at risk. I call on all the European governments to secure the Jews there. And again, I repeat, Israel is waiting for any Jew, wherever he may be. Turning to elections and the latest Likud campaign video is causing an uproar. Meretz candidates Masi Raz and Gabi Lasky say it accuses the left, say it accuses the left of aiding terrorists and are asking Attorney General Yehuda Weinstein to open an investigation against Netanyahu following the release last night. In the video, four actors in a truck dressed as ISIS fighters and waving ISIS flags can be seen approaching a second vehicle on sandy dunes in Israel. After pulling up to the driver, an ISIS man asks, My brother, which way to Jerusalem? He responds, Take a left. The ISIS truck can then be seen steering to the left and driving off into the distance with a sticker plastered to its back reading, anyone but Bibi, the slogan used by the Zionist Union. The video ends with the tagline, the left will give in to terror. The Zionist Union said in response, Netanyahu is living a fantasy if he thinks we've forgotten his colossal failure in the area of security. He released more than 1,000 prisoners with blood on their hands, strengthened Hamas, Iran became a nuclear threshold state on his watch, and the personal security of Israelis is compromised daily. Last week, the Zionist Union unveiled a new negative campaign under the headline, Only a Sucker Votes Netanyahu. Meanwhile, Netanyahu's upcoming address to a joint session of Congress continues to stir the American political scene, including the American Jewish community. Placing himself at odds with other American Jewish organizational leaders, Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel has spoken out, following his full-page ads in the New York Times and Washington Post yesterday, 
urging Obama, President Obama and others to support Netanyahu's appearance and not to sign a dangerous agreement with Iran, allowing it to become a nuclear threshold state. Asked why it is important for Netanyahu to address Congress, Brazil told Yisrael Hayom that Netanyahu raises public awareness and that is very important at this time. I am not the only one who thinks that the Iranians must not be allowed to develop nuclear weapons, but some people need to hear more and get a better understanding of the situation. Netanyahu is the Prime Minister of Israel, and as such, there is no one more suited to go to Congress and speak about this issue. Many, like me, view his upcoming speech at Congress as an historic act. In an interview with CNN over the weekend, Minister Bennett also spoke forcefully in defense of Netanyahu's speech, despite the potential rift in relations between Israel and the United States. He was also asked about a possible rift between the American Jewish community and Israel. No, at the end of the, the day, the, I hope that all the Jews will remain united, but we live here. And you know, the West was wrong over the past 10 years so many times. No one predicted that Mubarak would fall. No one predicted that Morsi would fall. No one predicted that ISIS would come about. And no one predicted the Arab Spring or the Muslim winter. And the West, who was sure they were doing the right thing, uh, in order to appease Nazi Germany, they sold Czechoslovakia. Israel will not be the next Czechoslovakia. And America is our best and biggest friend. Nothing will change that. But we have to make our case to the free world to stop this imminent threat. And that's it for the political and diplomatic news today. Erin? Thanks for that report. Controversy over this year's Israel Prize refuses to dissipate despite agreement by two judges to return to their posts after Prime Minister Netanyahu first removed them but then later retracted his objection to their participation on advice from Attorney General Yuda Weinstein. Six candidates for the prestigious prize and three other judges on the literary panel are still refusing to backtrack on the decision to distance themselves from the award. Led by best-selling writer David Grossman, Justice Chaim Sharir, Professor Ziva Ben-Portat, and Dr. Uri Hollander have announced that they will not take part in this year's event, arguing that it has been tainted by the Prime Minister's meddling in the composition of the judging panel. Ruth Dayan has also withdrawn her candidacy for the Lifetime Achievement Award. Grossman said that he is refusing to cooperate because the freedom of spirit, thought, and creativity of the country were violated by Netanyahu's cynical and destructive ploy. According to Sharir, there is no possibility of now granting the award with integrity given what has transpired. After saying that the Israel Prize is dear to everyone and must be preserved and protected, President Reuven Rivlin is encouraging all of the justices and the contenders to participate. Congress and the American people need to hear what Prime Minister Netanyahu has to say about Iran's nuclear program. This according to former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee, who is currently visiting the country. The presumptive 2016 Republican presidential candidate told IBA's R.A.O. Sullivan that the discord over Netanyahu's upcoming address is due to internal U.S. politics and not anti-Israel sentiment. He absolutely should go. And the reason is not for his sake, it's for America's sake. This may not be in his best interests. You know, it's proved to be unfortunately and unnecessarily controversial. But his reason for going is uh, not because this is good for his political situation. This is good for America to hear from the Israeli Prime Minister. Because in hearing from the Israeli Prime Minister, whoever it may be, we're hearing the voice of the leader of our closest friend not just in the Middle East, but perhaps our closest real friend and ally in the world. And we need to know the perspective of those closer to Iran on what that threat really represents to Israel as well as to the United States. So I welcome his coming and I look forward to what he will say and I think the American people will benefit from his perspective. But not all the senators and congressmen will hear him, so we'll avoid the, his speech. Is this becoming, is Israel becoming a bipartisan issue in Washington? The internal politics of America, I think, are different than the support that Americans have for Israel. Um, if some of the Democrats decide not to come, first of all, I'd be happy to take their seats. If they'd like to let me come and sit, I'd more than gladly occupy one of those chairs. Um, but I don't think that this is in any way reflecting an attitude toward Israel. Uh, I believe it has all to do with the internal politics of the U.S., uh, American people are very strong in their support of Israel, remain so. What do you think of the White House's policy towards Iran? I think it's naive to believe that you can sit down and reason with a rattlesnake. 
and we're dealing with a rattlesnake in Iran. We're not dealing with people who are rational. Anyone who denies the Holocaust, anyone who speaks of another nation, as Iran has of Israel, and they would like to be wiped off the face of the map, um, any nation, a state that would sponsor Hamas and Hezbollah, and sponsor terrorism, and sponsor the murder of innocent children, and indiscriminate attacks upon uh, civilized people, that is not a nation you sit down and negotiate with. You, you just don't. There's nothing to negotiate. So you do everything you can to, uh, to put your boot on their neck, not to offer them a warm cup of soup. So what we're doing is boneheaded, in my view. Do you think there's a growing Islamophobia in the United States? When I hear that term, I always try to question, what, is, what do you mean by Islamophobia? Because if you mean that we recognize the real threat that Islam uh, and the radical versions of it pose to freedom all over the world, that's not Islamophobia, that's reality. What I worry about are the people who deny the clear and present threat that radical jihadism presents to the world, its balance of power, and to people who love freedom all over the place. When I think of, it's not Islamophobia to say, we've got to stop people who would abduct, rape, and torture a bunch of little girls in the name of Boko Haram. It's not Islamophobia to say that it's wrong to cut off the heads of children because they're Christians and won't renounce Christ. It's not Islamophobia to say that there's something hideously wrong about going in and spraying bullets all over a Jewish delicatessen in Paris or murdering people who happen to draw some cartoons that you don't like. If that's Islamophobia, then we need more of it. What we need less of is this accommodation to evil. We need to call it what it is. You can't defeat an enemy if you don't recognize it. If you don't truly direct um, the light on it, and we'll never defeat um, jihadism if we don't understand what it's driven by. The ceasefire in eastern Ukraine largely appears to be holding after going into effect at midnight last night. Officials say, except for around the strategic railway hub of Dibaltsev, the development is rekindling slender hopes of a reprieve from the conflict between government troops and Russian-backed separatists that have claimed the lives of more than 5,300 people since it erupted last April. International attention will now be focused in the coming days on Dibaltsev, where Ukrainian forces have been fending off of a severe onslaught by the rebels for weeks. The town is a railway link between the main separatist-held cities of Donetsk and Luhansk. During a morning briefing, a spokesman for the Ukrainian Army's general staff said that the ceasefire is basically working, although there have been 10 reports of shelling, with all but one incident occurring near Dibaltsev. The rebels are also accusing the military of having deployed artillery to the area shortly after midnight. Former Lebanese Prime Minister Saad al-Hariri is calling on Hezbollah to withdraw from Syria, saying that its involvement in the neighboring country's civil war has backfired into his own. He made the remarks during a speech given shortly after returning to Lebanon from self-imposed exile to mark the 10th anniversary of his father's assassination in a slaying that sharply divided the country. Rafiq al-Hariri was killed with 21 others in a massive truck bombing in Beirut, February 14, 2005. A United nations batch tribunal is trying five Hezbollah members for killing Harari, who was also a former premier and considered Lebanon's most prominent Sunni politician. His son Saad is a harsh critic of Hezbollah, as well as Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, whom he accused during his speech of destroying Syria on the heads of his own citizens. The Shiite terror organization has deployed fighters to participate in the war to support regime forces against predominantly Sunni rebels who are trying to remove Assad from power. Hariri's comments come as Syrian troops backed by Hezbollah are on the offensive in continued attempts to recapture rebel-held areas on the edge of the Golan Heights. We now return to the terror attacks in Denmark, and we are able to bring you the report from IBA's Margot Dudkevich. Copenhagen remains on high alert after a man believed to have been responsible for two deadly attacks over the weekend was shot dead by security forces before dawn this morning. Chief Police Inspector Torben Molgaard Jensen said a special task force shot the man at Nora Port Station, who is suspected of being involved in both shooting attacks Saturday, in which two people were killed and five injured. Many loose ends need to be sorted out, police said, adding security forces will continue to maintain a beefed-up presence in the capital.
It is an infinitely sad morning with everyone thinking of the victims and their families, Danish Prime Minister Helthornig Schmidt told reporters. Two innocent people have lost their lives as a result of cold-blooded acts of terror against Denmark. We stand here in front of the um, Jewish synagogue in Copenhagen. We are devastated today. A man has lost his life in a service uh, of that uh, uh, synagogue, and we are uh, devastated. Our thoughts go to his family. Uh, we are with them today. But our thoughts go to the whole uh, of the Jewish community today. They belong in Denmark. They are a strong part of our community, and we will do everything we can to protect the Jewish community uh, in our country. In the Danish capital, police cordoned off streets, checked private vehicles and taxis, and set up roadblocks. On Saturday night, a Jewish man was fatally shot in the head and two police officers wounded after being shot outside a synagogue. The attacker fled on foot. The victim was identified as Dan Uzan in his 30s, whose father is Israeli and his mother Danish. He was guarding the synagogue where a bar mitzvah ceremony was underway. Dan Rosenberg Asmussen, head of Denmark's Jewish community, said some 80 people were gathered inside the synagogue at the time of the shooting. I dare not think about what would have happened if the killer had access to the congregation, he said. We were just at the, uh, the bar just across the synagogue. Um, we were just in for uh, some drinks and uh, have a good time out uh, on a Saturday in Copenhagen. And then we didn't hear anything until these um, SWAT people from uh, the police uh, entered the, the street just in front, um, wearing helmets, helmets and uh, automatic rifles. Uh, we looked outside the window and saw this guy lying in the street just uh, on the other side of the, the pavement. Hours earlier, some 40 bullets were fired at the Kudondan Cafe, where a debate on Islam and freedom of speech was being held. A 55-year-old man was killed and three police officers injured. The attacker fled the site in a car. Police said they believe the target of the attack was Lars Vilks, a Swedish artist whose life has been threatened for his cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad. French ambassador to Denmark, Francois Zimmeret, who spoke at the event, was unharmed and later called the shooting a terror attack, likening it to the deadly shooting on the Charlie Hebdo office in Paris in January. Wilkes has been forced to live under constant protection since 2010 after drawings depicting the Prophet Muhammad as a dog sparked death threats from Islamist groups. Shortly after the shootings, police found the getaway car used by the attacker abandoned in a street. The shooting attacks in Denmark brings to the forefront once again the threat posed by Islamist radicals on the European population and Europe's Jewish communities in general. Margot Utkevich, IBA News. Jerusalem Post diplomatic correspondent Herb Kanan is also the author of a monthly column entitled Out There, A Slice of Israeli Life is Seen Through the Eyes of an Immigrant. He tells IBA's Eli Wogelenter about the nature of the columns, which have now been collected into a book. Look, I've been writing these columns, Eli, I've been writing these columns in the Jerusalem Post on and off for, for now almost 25 years. In fact, even before my first child was born, and today he's 25, I've been writing these types of columns. And over the years, that's a lot of columns, a lot of stuff has happened, both in the family, which I write about, but also in the country. Uh, and I've, I tell you, I've gotten positive feedback about the columns over the years. It's funny because I'll write, like, and I could write a brilliant analysis on, on Prime Minister Netanyahu and his relationship with Abu Mazen, and the same day write one of these columns, and the only reaction I'll get will be to the columns. Uh, so because of that and the positive feedback, I thought, hey, it'd be a good idea to kind of put them together. So when they comment more on your columns versus the diplomatic stories that you're writing, you ever have the feeling, why am I writing these diplomatic stories if all they care about, all they read about are the columns? No, uh, because I think, I think people generally li like what they can relate to. There are a lot of people who are writing about politics and diplomacy, a lot of people are analyzing from every which angle out there, right? And generally, what's interesting, if somebody comes up to me and say they liked the analysis, right, what do they say? They're not saying they liked the way I wrote the analysis. They like it because they agree with it. 
right? The columns, I think, are, are a bit different. I think people like them because, again, they can recognize certain things that they go through inside the columns, and it, 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 it gives them a kind of a, hey, this happened to me type of moment. So I, uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't bother me that the, the columns get more reception than the political analysis is. I think, it's, I think that's rather natural and to be expected. You've written, what, 500, 600, 700 columns over the last 30 years. How do you pick the ones that went into this book? There's a lot of columns, but uh, I mean, I, I pick, essentially I pick my favorites. I pick the ones that I thought were, 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 were the best, the, the most well-written columns, the ones that, that reflected, uh, reflected a certain part of Israeli society, which I think is important to get out there. One of the things I want to do in the column and also in the book is all we read about Israel is the conflict. That's all we read about. People don't ever think about, well, what it's like to live here. Not, not in the shadow of terrorism, but what, just, just to live on a daily basis. What are the challenges? What are the nice things? What are the annoying things? What, what, what it's like raising kids who go into the army? That's the type of stuff I wanted to put in the book to kind of give a, put a human face on, on life in Israel, not just a political face. How has writing this column out there changed you over the last 25 years? That's an interesting question. What it does is it allows you to sit down just for a couple hours and just think about those little mundane things that always happen to you and think, well, hey, this is, this is kind of interesting. This is a small thing, kind of a small truth that if it happens to me, it happens to a lot of other people. And when you're able to articulate it, I find, uh, or we, we, first of all, when you're able to sit down and think about it, you don't lose that moment. But also when you're able to articulate something that, that, that you went through that is very commonplace, other people, when they read it, they go, hey, I know what the guy's talking about. That happens to me too. And I think that's a, I think that's a strong connection. You're writing as an immigrant from Denver, Colorado, looking at things with that immigrant's eye. How does that speak to the Israeli, the native Israeli? It doesn't. I mean, the book's not meant for the native Israeli. The book is meant for the immigrants. And it could be immigrants here. It is about immigrants here. And the book is very Israeli and it's very Jewish. But there's a certain immigrant experience, I imagine, that is common throughout the world. You come here as an immigrant, and that label and that feeling stays with you throughout. I've been here for 35 years, I still feel like an immigrant, right? I still worry when I open up my mouth in Hebrew, my, my kids still laugh at my accent. These are things you can't shake. I still look at things differently because of where I came from, because of the landscape of where I came from. And that's something that I think that, that, that immigrants can relate to, and that's another reason why I want to you know, try to put it into a book. Taking a look at local finance, and with no currency trading on Sundays, the shekel remains the same, while share prices on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange started off the trading week in the plus column. Here's a look at the afternoon numbers. The IBA weather team tells us that we can expect more scattered rain showers tonight and that tomorrow we should see light rain in the north and center of the country tapering off around noon, along with a slight drop in temperatures. Here's the forecast at home and abroad for the next 24 hours. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Laura Cornfield will be at this desk tomorrow to bring you the latest breaking news from Israel. I'm Erin Viner, joining everyone at IBA English News and wishing our very valued colleague, Lena Rosenthal, a very happy birthday. Yay! And all of our viewers, a good evening and shalom from Jerusalem.